Um, we will also have, look at this. Um, we'll also have Sue Ritter and Mike Smith will be here for the, what will now be the first agenda item. I will explain when the meeting starts. Oops. Oh, you're quick on the draw there, Paulette. Good job. Oh, we're getting live stream too? A lot of the, the town meetings are, are live streamed on YouTube now. And the planning board meetings have been the holdout because we just weren't ready. Well, can we add to our uh, stuff? Smash the like and subscribe. And don't forget to hit that bell. <laughs> yeah. Please do, Ariel. Actually, if we get more people to subscribe, um, if we hit 100, it helps with how we can manage things. So, like, I don't have a lot of Facebook friends, but I put it out there and, like, three of my family members follow just to, if we can get to 100, it will help us. Really? Yes, yeah. for John Little. What are the chances that we'll actually get a hundred people watching our meetings? Oh no, you just have to like it or follow it, smash the like button, whatever that is. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you got you gotta get a hundred subscribers. Oh the lingo. Oh go for 125. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um look at all these beautiful faces. I believe we have everyone here. Um and Liba, do you want to uh, let me make an announcement about the first uh, project? Sounds good. We'll officially call this meeting to order. It's 7 p.m. on Tuesday, October 19th. Chris, our I'm first so item. Glad. Thanks. <laughs> so um, our first item needed to be pulled from the agenda tonight. Um, I got a call from the applicant this morning. Carl Supricci called me and he said that the subdivision plat did not fully represent the full action, there is an additional piece of property that's going to be um, subdivided and consolidated and the plat didn't show it. So they will, they're gonna fix their map. And, uh, and so don't save your materials and they will be coming back to our planning board at another time, possibly soon. Can I make, can I make one brief comment? Yes. Because we, I mean, have, we, have, we have a few minutes here to, 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 that we could use up here. Um, one of my pet peeves is boundaries that follow center lines of creeks. And this has one and it's, it's a minor part of the, of the, of the proposed boundary. Now, not the, the final boundary, but I really do not like boundaries that are, that are center lines of creeks because water, water courses move over time, but the boundary doesn't. So that's, that's my statement. Moving on. You have been very consistent with that statement throughout the years, Fred. Yeah, I have. Thank you. All right. So why, why are maps drawn that way? Why do they go to the center line? Don't ask me. I, I mean, why do they use the, why do they use the creek as a boundary? Why don't they just, you know, draw a line and, you know, an artificial line like they do every place else? I guess, yeah, no, thank you very much. I, <laughs> I think it's just an obvious, at the time at least, an obvious um, boundary marker. Boundary point, yeah. yeah. It's like in the old days when they used trees and they would blaze trees to indicate, you know, boundary lines. So, or pile, pile, yeah. pile, pile rocks up in, 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 uh, on high. So, yeah, I wish they would. Well, kind of, Fred, also, you know, just as the uh, stream may change its course over a number of years, the uh, maybe the intent of the property owners is to share access to the stream. So if it changes course and you have it on, say, an easterly uh, side of it and it changes so there's no access from one property owner, that could be the reason for center line. Yeah, it could be. It could be. But the problem is what happens when the creek has moved 20 years, 50 years down the road? You know, 
the boundary hasn't moved. What's interesting about these boundaries is that um, they're not always on the creek. Yeah. That there are yeah. places where they're not, you know, yep. they're not on the creek at all. Yep. All right. All right, Tim. A discussion for another day. Yeah. Yes. Is that the town board that would change that as a ruling? No. I'm not. I, I'm not going to touch that one. I I don't actually know. I don't think so. We have at least one attorney in the room. Well, yeah, we have we have one too many attorney in the room. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> <get it. laughs> The, All right, uh, friends, I'm going to move us along. For, for what it's worth, the uh, back in common law and history, uh, when it was a more agrarian society, creeks were really valuable. And so farmers would share them uh, by owning to the center line. And then there were the rights of accretion if the creek moved. The boundary line actually did move. Um, so it is possible to have it, you can have it, both ways or either way rather you can set the boundary line at its location at a point in time or you can just say it's going to follow the creek as the creek moves so. thank you peter that's what i was going to say it yeah. is an incredible annoyance though because it makes surveys useless after a while and um it's almost as bad as a description that begins at the fourth apple tree in the third row behind the <laughs> rock, you know, in, in 1870. And that's what I was attempting to say. Yeah. For the, for the record, Mr. Grossman has sat next to me as legal counsel during planning board meetings. That's so, true. Shall we proceed forward then to our second item? All right. Um, so this is another preliminary and final subdivision approval for a proposed two lot subdivision located at 293 Bundy Road. The proposal involves subdividing the property into 14 plus or minus acre parcel, parcel A, containing the existing residence and garage at 293 Bundy Road and a 9.12 plus or minus uh, acre parcel, parcel B, which contains an existing greenhouse and barn garage. Um, excuse me. We, we need, have... we need, we need to proceed slowly. Because the public hearing has been legally advertised at 7.15. Just be careful. Okay, understood. So um, I have Stephen... So I would just like to say that um, I'm a neighbor and um, I don't feel like it'll affect how I um, see this subdivision, but I do want to put that on the record. I'd like to state for the record that um, um, I know uh, Jeff Magosh, I know Stephen's brother, um, he and I will have a 50th high school reunion uh, next year. So I look forward to seeing him again. Again, that I, that I will still I will still vote on this matter, of course. Great. So we have Stephen Magosh and Jeffrey Magosh as owner applicants, and Natalie French, um, Barney Grossman, and uh, Debeau as agent. Who would like to present a little bit on this project this evening? I'm Peter Grossman. Fred introduced me to those of you who were here before. Uh, Natalie is unable to be here tonight, and she's my associate, so I'm representing the office, representing uh, the Magosh brothers in this application. Uh, we were hoping that um, the purchaser, prospective purchaser of the subdivided lot would be here as well. Um, Dave, oh, there's David. Hi, David. David Fernandez. Uh, he can fill in some blanks, I'm sure, as to what his plans are for the property. Um, it is, as uh, described, improved by uh, a greenhouse of sorts and a garage of sorts. It's really become quite um, uh, downtrodden, derelict. The greenhouse has no glass in it anymore. It's basically the frame of a greenhouse. Um, the garage is a cinder block structure. 
Uh, David can fill in some of this, but my understanding is he intends to uh, restart or reconstruct the greenhouse and the garage on the property and to use it for agricultural purposes. Uh, so that would be a reversion to its old use. Um, it was a greenhouse run by Steve and Jeff's uh, grandfather, I think, started it uh, long ago. Um, was that Steve's greenhouse? Oh, Andy. Was it Andy? What was the name of it, Steve? Oh, your, your mic. I think you're you're muted, Steve. Uh, Steve's greenhouse. Okay, Steve's greenhouse, yeah, on Bundy Road. And that was there oh, roughly from 1964 to 86. Uh, and it has not been used really other than maybe for some storage since. And that once the uh, elements got in, that was not practical either. Um, it's a pretty straightforward division into two lots. Uh, frontage is available, curb cuts available, access is there. There's, uh, I believe, a water source in existence for the greenhouse uh, and garage. Um, I don't believe there's a separate septic system. Steve, can you? Uh, there is no septic. Okay, okay. Um, and I don't know what David's plans are for that. Um, the house will continue to be a residence. That's where Jeff Magosh resides at this time. Um, there are a couple of things uh, that are noteworthy in the papers that we submitted, and those in particular have to do with environmental questions. Um, in the uh, EAF, uh, there was um, some cement board uh, that was in the greenhouse that had been used for years as um, shelving to hold uh, potted plants. And uh, that uh, was, uh, it was a concern that there might be asbestos uh, in that cement board. Um, it was tested and in fact, yes, uh, there was asbestos in it. Um, it was removed from that building uh, to Stevens property um, uh, where he's going to possibly make use of it in the future uh, since it was non in its in its existing location it was non friable uh, and uh, moving is never a good thing but uh, he's got it over at his house in Enfield at this point. Um, the second item is a underground tank that had been used for fuel oil for the furnace in the greenhouse to keep the plants warm in the winter. Um, that is in existence. I don't think anybody has looked at it in ages. Uh, the contract of sale provides that the purchaser will undertake to remove that tank and remediate any issues related to it. But other than that, I think it's a fairly straightforward uh, application as you know, in terms of lot size and, and shape. Could I correct one small thing? Sure. Okay, yeah, it was uh, just a very minor point, but the tank is above ground, not oh, below okay. ground. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Okay, and David, could you just give the, the board an, a little bit of an idea what your plan is for the property? Sure. Um, so I, of course, remember um, uh, uh, Stephen Jeff's grandfather, old Mr. Magosh, very well because I've had been growing trees at our Bundy Road farm for over 40 years. And he was selling tomatoes and flowers and so forth out there himself uh, in that era. And the greenhouse was fully functional. Uh, the water supply is, in fact, from 283 Bundy Road, which is directly adjacent which we also own, um, we probably will put in a well or a new water uh, source. So uh, as it was indicated in the little summary, we have the intent to restore the head house, which is about the size of a two car garage, but it's where you would do potting up and where you would have a furnace and where you might store tractors and it would support our nursery operation. The greenhouse is ruined in the sense that all the glass is broken um, and there are trees growing up in what was the, the gravel floor. But uh, there are, um, the frame is in actually very good shape. Our intent would be to use it as an overwintering house as opposed to a hot house where you're growing geraniums and so forth, since we have a retail nursery on the other side of the lake already. Um, that is the front area. Um, 
we um, there is an electric supply which would have to be restored. There isn't a septic. And I'm not sure that we would need it, but you know there are field sanitation rules for agricultural workers. We currently have, you know, a portage on, and uh, you know I'd like to have a wash station for staff for our staff, and it may require a septic system. So that's something we'll look into. Um, we will. I already had hired an environmental engineer, Wayne Madison, who had handled spill cleanups for some of our clients in the past that we and we've worked with them and he came out and looked at it in february when we put in the initial offer and um, the tank is above ground it's not clear whether to what extent uh, uh, there is there is a spill or a leak or anything like that so the, usually the, the procedure is i will undertake to hire him he will uh, take test samples they'll send them off we'll open a claim with the dec uh, right away and uh, then just do the remediation as required by law, basically, whatever it is required. Um, and we've been involved with this before and have a rough idea of what we think will be involved if should the test come back that it is required. Um, the middle part of the property is a brushy area. We might build a farm pond for irrigation. The back part of the property is a very lovely woodland that has a, a wetland going through it, a, a, a sort of intermittent stream, but it's sort of a slew, a broad area of wet forest and uh, quite a lot of water runs through this area toward the Sawinski lot line. And um, we don't intend to disturb the forest in any way except um, some firewood cutting and that kind of thing. So those are the three uses, the land that joins all our other lands. And we just feel it supports our agricultural operation that we've had going for all these years. And we'd like to continue. Both of you for your statements. Um, questions from the planning board. Uh, I just wanna hear from Mike Smith if he is aware of any other issues. No, it meets all the zoning requirements um, for the ag zone. So it's, it's all set. And we have a data statement from for the ag zone. So we're all set there. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, let's turn then to the seeker form itself and take a look at the form. Any questions or comments on the form? I guess I have uh, one question on, um, let's see here, page two. So it's uh, part one, page two, question number 11. Um, it talked about just a few moments ago that parcel B will not require an additional septic if in fact, uh, that's uh, for sanitary purposes in a washroom and such. Would that this answer change? Uh, presumably, yes. I could respond to that also. We haven't decided whether a washroom and a septic system is something we will pursue at the moment. Mm -hmm. We operate, you know, legally with the. Uh, Hand wash stations and uh, porta john, and may just continue that. But you know, I like to provide better facilities for our staff wherever possible. And uh, you know, being an agricultural worker is often tough. You don't you're just sort of out there in the field. And yep. the idea of having a lunch room and maybe uh, a sink. But if you have a sink, then the water has to go someplace. So it's possible that as we develop the property, we may decide to pursue that. Uh, if so, it would be in this initial zone here, not in the wilder zones out back. Okay. Marty, mostly those would be issues that would come up with you and your department at some future point in time, if and when the subdivision is granted. Um, not always, I would say. Uh, they specifically would deal with the Tompkins County Health Department. Um, yeah when issuing or getting or receiving those types of applications. Okay, thank you. 
but regards, but before us is a subdivision. So I'm not sure it's relevant today. Mm -hmm. um, page one, question five, rural should be marked as well as agricultural and commercial. I don't have a problem with that. Chris, can you add the, both of those two? I don't know if you heard Yvonne. Um, so I, I, I was not actually paying attention. I was gonna leave this up to Mike Smith. Oh, my apologies, sorry. Mike, <laughs> you're right. Okay. Did you catch both of those? Yep, I got them. Okay. Any other, yes, Susan? On the part three, uh, the second paragraph says the property is zoned agriculture and that should say agricultural. That's the name of our zone. So just change the E to AL. And then the same change <clears throat> needs to be made in the seeker resolution in whereas one. And then, and again, and then when we get to the approval resolution. Any other questions or changes on the uh, seeker form? Well, on um, page two, question 10, will the proposed action connect to an existing public or private water supply? Um, and the answer is yes. So has that been decided that David, were you saying that it's already connected to your other parcel? It is there. Yes, actually, um, I think it was Jeff who discovered water coming up in the greenhouse. We didn't even know a valve was on, so we turned that off. I'm actually planning to disconnect that connection. It's currently sealed off the, at the house because otherwise, it you can't. We can't run a water supply to this building from the house because it, there isn't quite enough water pressure in the well to begin with, you know. So uh, the water isn't always the greatest up on Bundy Road, and uh, we want to preserve it for the nice uh, our tenants, the nice couple who are writers who live in the house there. Can I can I can I offer up the fact that the answer to that question is no that the proposed yeah. action will not connect to an existing public private water supply because the proposed action is a subdivision. And subdivisions don't connect to the water supply. Site plans do, for example. So no. I think the answer is no. Well, in that case then- What's in front of us is, is, is subdividing a lot. Right, and it's, if no, then describe the method of providing potable, portable water, so. At that, to me, that's later on whether it's whether they need a whether they need to submit some sort of a building plan or whether they need to go to the health department to get uh, an approval. Yeah, to me, that's not part of, of, of a subdivision. That's what we're being asked us to divide a lot into. Two. That's all. Okay, but then you do you need to answer this question that it's not the answer to me would be no. The answer to me would be no. Well, Chris, don't we usually fill this out? We always, always do. We do for every, so, every subdivision where we have any inkling of what's going to be happening. Yes, that's correct. And we traditionally have done that. So if we have, like what you said, if we have an idea of what might be happening on any of the properties, then we fill this out. If it's, if the application materials just say we're subdividing the property and there's no other information, then we either leave it blank or we say no. If it's helpful, I can say that we are not planning on any connection to an existing private or public water supply. Okay, and so then do you write in there, not applicable before it says, describe the method, not applicable. Sure, that's, we have done that in the past. Okay. Other conversation about the form? Nope. All right. Um, for the proposed resolution then for the seeker, uh, may I have a motion of negative determination of environmental significance? So moved. 
uh, Yvonne, yes, and yes, then Fred, yes. I'm going to give you the second to okay. that. Yvonne put her hand up first. That's fine. So um, let's just take a quick look at this proposed resolution. Um, we are going to make the adjustment for agricultural uh, zone and whereas number one. Um, any other changes to happen? All right, um, no other changes. All those in favor, please signal by saying aye. 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 Uh, uh, Liba? Yes? Margaret is both muted and we don't have a video, so I'm not sure we know how she voted. Is she Margaret she uh, alternate? We have yeah, she can't vote because um, her video wasn't on. You, you, you are considered in attendance if your video is not on. So I sent her a couple of messages in the chat asking her to turn the video on. You probably just didn't see the chat. Um, no, I didn't. So, so yeah, she shouldn't vote on, on this. I didn't okay. know that I was needed for voting tonight either, so. Well, you never know, right? <laughs> sure. All right, um, any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion passes. Um, so next we'll move on to the public hearing on this item. Uh, do I have any members of the public wishing to um, speak on this subdivision matter? Mike, anybody calling in or Paulette? I have not received any emails. I don't see anybody, although the person on the phone keeps popping up. I'm not quite sure. So if the person that has dialed in wants to speak, they should indicate so now. Okay, and I have received no phone calls. All right. So with that then, I will close the public hearing at 7.25 p.m. And okay. Um, oh. Are we, this is the public hearing for the um, baseball field, is it? No. Not yet. So we just finished. Yes. No, not yet. We have a. We are finishing on the subdivision for uh, the second agenda item for uh, before the planning board tonight. Okay, so I should just hold on for the public hearing on the other. Yes, ma'am. On the. Okay, thank you. I'll hold on. All right. Okay, um, so moving forward then uh, to the uh, resolution on, scrolling to it, um, preliminary and final subdivision approval. Liba, I'll move, the, I'll move the motion as amended to change agricultural to agricultural. And I will second. Use. Thank you, Greg. Any additional comments or questions on this? Looking to Susan, looking to Mike. Nope. All right. Um, with that, then, with no additional comments or amendments, all those um, in favor, please signal by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstained? All right. And the motion passes for preliminary and final subdivision approval. Thank you, Mr. Grossman, Mr. Fernandez, and Mr. May, may, can you say it may again? Gosh. May, may gosh. gosh, thank you. <laughs> Good to see you, Peter. Good to see you, Fred. Take care. Right. Thank, thank you, you all. Yeah. Thank you. All right, uh, turning our attention now uh, to the third agenda item, and this is for the proposed new Cornell, Cor I'm sorry, proposed Cornell new baseball field. Um, and this is related to consideration of preliminary site plan approval and special permit um, for the proposed new Cornell University baseball field project located near the corners of Ellis Hollow Road and Game Farm Road, town, town of Ithaca, text parcel numbers 62 62.2-3, 62.2-4, 62.2-5, dot dash two dash six in the low density residential zone. 
Um, which members are, would like to speak on this project today um, from Cornell University? Hi, this is, this is David Cutter. Um, I'll be the lead off speaking here for the university. Um, if I may, I would like to uh, share my screen. We have a, a brief presentation that we would like to share with you. And uh, then uh, we'll get started if, it, if you're ready for that. Thank you very much. Okay, let me see if I can get this to work. Well, while I'm, while I'm playing with my technology here to get to get this working, um, let me just say that uh, I, you know, I'm really happy to be able to share this with you today. Um, with me today, I will have um, our associate university architect, uh, Jay Shimetta, who will be speaking, as well as our consulting engineer, Michael Mantel from Stantec. And now you should be seeing my screen. Is that working for everybody now? See it. Great. So again, thanks. We're really pleased to share with you our plans for bringing baseball out to Gate Farm Road today. And to uh, just to get as a Point of introduction and just a reminder baseball, you know, we're talking about NCAA Division I varsity sport here. It's been with Cornell about as long as we've existed. It's about 150 years. Interestingly enough, though, the first 50 years, baseball wasn't actually played on the Cornell main campus. It was down at Percy Field, which is today where the Ithaca High School uh, is located. Um, but Toy Field, has been the home for Cornell baseball for the last hundred years or so. Well, coming up on a hundred years next year. Um, but unfortunately, Hori baseball field, um, it's gonna be the site for a new academic building. And so Game Farm Road site is what we are proposing now for the baseball development, you know, and we're hoping that, that we'll be able to build this out slowly over time to possibly accommodate other athletic fields in the future. So Game Farm Road site itself, it's about 180 acres of land holding that spans various county roads from Game Farm Road to the west, Ellis Hollow Road there along the south, Pine Tree Road along the east, um, or on the west, I'm sorry. It's uh, that whole eastern boundary is actually adjacent to the town of Dryden, our neighbors out there. And here on the western side is East Hill Plaza, right, and adjacent housing on this side. And it's Cascadilla Creek and the associated natural areas along the north. Um, we've been using this site at Coinell for both agricultural production and some research for many de decades at this point. Um, most recently, it had been planted to kind of a hay pasture mixture of grasses. And just a reminder that our existing baseball field, Hoy Field, is out over here in the city of Ithaca on kind of that southern edge of campus. Um, as further review, when we introduced you to this project back at Sketch Plan, which was mid-June, you know, we kind of shared with you some of our thinking behind selecting the site for the new baseball field, as well as some of the constraints and opportunities we took into consideration, including thinking about existing utilities, topography, you know, some of the neighboring uses and the environmental impact. Um, this is, you know, in the town, it's part of the, as you mentioned, the low density residential zone. Um, it, we do already have some existing athletic fields out here. So it seems like there's good compatibility there. Um, we know we have to be sensitive to the Cascadero Creek you know, uh, natural area. That is a kind of downslope from the entire site. And we know that there's actually pretty decent uh, access to both transportation and utilities uh, as part of the site. 
One of the things that you asked during sketch plan, you wanted to hear a little bit more about our kind of long range thinking for this site here. Um, and it's been, gosh, nearly 20 years now since we proposed to locate our soccer practice fields out at the Game Farm Road site. But during that whole interim period, we have seriously been thinking about the likely necessity of having to really relocate other athletic athletic facilities off of central campus. So what we're looking at here is from uh, our 2008 campus master plan, which did anticipate a need to, to convert some of these fields to academic building sites. So it looked at a couple different uh, approaches or possible visions for incrementally relocating athletic facilities. So this image you'll see, there are actually a couple places that they suggested we could be placing baseball either out kind of Pine Tree Road where we have some athletics already or else up here in our, the site we're looking at, the Game Farm Road site. Now, while the, the, the practice facilities for soccer are really the only athletic facilities that we've had out there in the last 15 years, back in 2014, we did initiate a planning study to better understand you know, what is the capacity out here at Game Farm Road to support athletic facilities? And of course, what kind of infrastructure would we need to, in order to support it? So this is the image from that 2015 study. You know, that it also places baseball kind of down in that Northwest corner, as well as showing where we could add additional athletic field sites, um, a, some kind of a clubhouse, and obviously the kind of the needed road parking infrastructure, kind of green infrastructure that one would need to support a long range plan for uh, a vision for this area. One thing of note here, um, this vision really thought about or suggested that we could relocate the existing NYSEG lines that really bisect the site right now. Whoops, sorry. I wrapping it around on the northern side of the site so that we could have a whole site through here. Uh, bring you up to date. So during kind of our early planning for this new baseball field, we again kind of updated this long range vision for the site to reflect number one, kind of the, the current, the specific location where we wanted to put the baseball field and some of the other kind of programmatic and, and site considerations such as, you know, it's probably a very low probability that we're gonna be able to relocate the nice egg transmission lines that cut through here. So we're kind of taking that both as a given at this point. So this vision places baseball closer to existing um, infrastructure, both roads and, and utilities, and basically more central to a more I guess you could call it a more compact athletic complex. Um, you know, it may be another 15 or 20 years before the next athletic facility looks out to Game Farm Road for a potential new home. But, you know, we think that this vision really incorporates potential sites for anything from, you know, a, a competition soccer, um, the uh, uh, track and field, um, facilities, as well as very additional practice fields that would be needed and needed, you know, parking and, and road infrastructure as well. David, David, yes. have, yes, you, have, have you uh, have you moved the electrical lines underground in that in that drawing? No, they would the the elect the, as, as in the nice ignite high transmission lines, they have about a 225 foot right of way that goes right, basically follows right across this area, okay. Okay. existing location. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Glad I could clarify that. So back focusing on baseball itself, you know, some of the obvious goals we want for this project, obviously it has to meet NCAA Division I baseball requirements. You know, we also have our own internal goals of for sustainable design that include a leaf silver, and of course, I'm complying with the Ithaca Energy Code supplement. You know, we obviously want to be thoughtful in our site development. We like kind of that rural, the green open character that we have there. And we know that, of course, we're going to have to provide infrastructure to support the baseball program at the site. So what is that baseball program? Um, it's basically a 500 seat capacity baseball facility, although in reality, 
for the last decade or so, we've had somewhere 95 to 100 is kind of a typical number of spectators. But the main, mainly it's a large synthetic turf baseball field with all the typical accoutrements of dugout scoreboard and all that. Um, associated with that is a clubhouse facility. That's where we would have the team locker rooms, um, bathrooms, coaches office, showers, umpire room, you know, some of those things that are required again for games as well as indoor batting cages. Uh, a separate um, structure would house a small press box and spectator toilet facilities as well. So diving in a little bit closer. So access would be via the Ellis Hollow Road you know, based on discussions we had with the county, we created the intersection essentially across from Hungerford Hill Road there. As you're coming in, you know, you have views kind of looking over the, the seating bowl you know, towards the field itself in this area. And then you will gently kind of turn into going into uh, parking bays, which we've tried to break up with an entry plaza, some planting areas in that area here. If uh, buses coming in would come in, stop here, unload at the entry plaza then and pull around. And we've got a long strip of parallel parking for buses on the, along the Astor, western edge here. Um, also around the entry plaza here, we've got bus parking. That's where our ADA parking is and our accessible route for people to get either into the, the, uh, the clubhouse facility itself or for typically for spectators to get to the seating area or all the way up to the public restrooms as well. Uh, we have um, we have around the, the field itself, kind of the outfield, right, is surrounded by an eight foot chain link fence and lower four foot chain link fences secure the rest of that field in this area here. Um, we don't have any lighting for the field itself. The only lighting is safety lighting, basically security lighting out in this lower parking lot and at the entry plaza itself. And all that lighting, of course, would be that uh, night sky compliant and it'd be LED lighting with, at a 300K uh, temperature, kind of that lower level. Will the scoreboard be electronic? Uh, the scoreboard does does have electronic to right to show the the details, yes. But it's not so it's not it's not like at whole. It's uh, an LED. To, right. Correct. Right. Yeah. Yep. Um, looking at the landscape itself, obviously the main thing is this synthetic turf uh, infield system here, totally within the fenced area there. Around it, we would have kind of a, a low grow lawn maintained both around the perimeter as well as kind of the seating berm that we have on the outside here. And then the rest of the landscape is, is really quite simple um, and low, kind of low key in keeping with uh, the larger site. We've got enhanced meadow plantings to uh, in basically most of the disturbed areas. And then we've got some tree buffering to the parking areas, providing some windbreak, framing views, and, and again, kind of against the backdrop, windbreak and back in that area as well. So for an overview next of kind of the architecture and how it integrates in the site plan, I'm gonna turn it over to Jay Schmetta, our Cornell's Associate University Architect. So Jay. Good evening. Thank you for the introduction, David. The, the two buildings that we'll share with you tonight are designed to complement the beauty of the surrounding open fields, as David described, by attempting to fit into the sloping landscape. Um, the buildings are designed to be energy efficient and to meet a minimum of LEED Silver certification. And they're inspired by rural vernacular architecture with a crisp contemporary look. The, the image that you see in front of you shows you the press box that's located right at the back of um, the spectator seating. It also contains a toilet room uh, facility. That, that building is only a thousand square feet. Um, and then over to the right, you can see the clubhouse uh, building, which is for student athletes. 
um, to provide a space for their team room and locker room and an indoor practice facility. And that facility allows access out onto the field, um, into left field, there'll be roll up doors to bring out equipment. Um, yeah, if you could go to the next slide, David. So this is looking back from the field um, at the press box. You can see we've um, created seating areas for ADA compliance for wheelchair access um, to the sides of the press back box yeah, and, uh, and over to the west edge. Um, and the poles are not for lighting. They're for holding back the safety netting um, and that'll protect the spectators and, and the clubhouse building. The sound amplification, oh, one, one last thing and then we can go to that image, David. Um, the sound amplification is strictly on the uh, field facing side of the press box um, to limit the amount of sound. Um, it's projected intentionally forward towards, towards the field only. Um, yeah, and this is an aerial view that shows you the use of um, standing seam metal roofing and corrugated metal siding with flat metal panels that are painted red in order to highlight certain key uh, areas on the building where, where David has his cursor is uh, the entrance door for the uh, student athletes to get in the facility and then on close to our side you can see the um, bullpen area for pitchers to warm up and there's a limited amount of storefront glazing for viewing out from the uh, clubhouse out to the field and all the way to the right is the the batting cages with the roll-up doors to access access the field and the last image is an elevation drawing. Um, this drawing shows you the materials I described. It also shows the profile of the building with roof lines that open out towards the playing field. And I'll be happy to take any questions on the building design at the end of the presentation. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to uh, Michael David Mantell, the civil engineer from Stantec. Mike will review uh, the site utilities on the project. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. And you had to throw the, the David middle name in there because it's hard to work on this project and not be named David. It seems like half the design team and everybody's named David. Um, but thank you, Jay. Uh, I am Mike Mantel. Uh, I'm the project civil engineer from Stantec, and I'll discuss some of the uh, technical aspects of the project and the site. Uh, so the, uh, the area drain or uh, slopes starting from the, uh, the southeast, kind of near the intersection of uh, Game Farm Road and Ellis Hollow Road, down towards the uh, northwest, towards Cascadilla Creek. Uh, so we're taking this facility and kind of cutting it into that slope. And we've done that for several reasons. Uh, it allows us to balance the soil cut fill for the, for the site, so we don't have to bring in additional fill or haul off additional soil material um, as a result of, uh, of the project. Um, we are returning the grades to uh, as quickly as possible to existing grades to try and minimize the uh, disturbance, uh, the earth disturbance for the facility. Um, it allows us to preserve those long views across the site as you're uh, as you're going by. Um, the elevation at uh, the intersection of Ellis Hollow Road and Game Farm Road is actually about 70 feet higher than the top of the clubhouse building would be. So it allows, it doesn't impact those, those long views looking across the site. Uh, we're proposing a, a berm along the adjacent to the first base, uh, first baseline for uh, providing, a, it's a grass covered berm, provide uh, you know, a seating area for people to sit and watch the game um, as an alternative to uh, sitting in the seats. Uh, drainage for this facility be uh, designed for positive drainage uh, the areas of undisturbed land that would uh, contribute runoff through this area, that runoff will be diverted around the facility and it'll continue on its existing drainage paths um, that they currently, uh, they currently flow under. Um, the site itself will be designed to collect drainage and direct it into vegetated swales uh, that will then discharge into an infiltration basin on the west uh, side of the project. 
Um, the vegetated swales provide pretreatment and, uh, and, and divert the runoff. Um, the infiltration basin uh, provide, it mitigates flow rates uh, from the project and provides water quality volume. Uh, so the downstream discharge will be uh, less than the existing um, conditions and the infiltration basin will uh, replenish groundwater. Uh, our electrical service, we're looking to, it's that purple line, uh, looking to connect into the overhead uh, New York State electric and gas line that runs parallel to Ellis Hollow Road. Um, so we've come from the facility south and uh, look to tie into that, uh, that public service. The IT communication service, the yellow line there, uh, we actually are looking to connect into an uh, existing on-site Cornell-owned uh, IT service, which is uh, northwest of the uh, proposed project, but within the Cornell property um, ad adjacent to, uh, to the uh, nearby property, but within our, our property, and that's a Cornell-owned service. Uh, water, we'd look to tie into the existing on-site Cornell water service that runs from the south to the north through the site. Um, we do have to redirect, uh, reroute a portion of that existing water service uh, in order to construct the, uh, the field facility. And then we'd have a new connection into the existing main uh, that would service the, uh, the buildings. And for sanitary, we're uh, proposing a new dedicated sewer um, that would run from the facility out to Ellis Hollow Road, run parallel with Ellis Hollow Road and connect into a town owned um, sewer near Summerhill Lane. And that's approximately 800 feet to the west of the uh, Cornell property. We did have a uh, archeological study done by Pan American and that was done for the entire Cornell owned parcels in this, uh, in this area. Um, they did uh, find uh, potential archeologically sensitive sites uh, within the area. Uh, there's two along Ellis Hollow Road that were former uh, locations for farmhouses. Uh, there is the previous uh, CCC camp location uh, that used to have several buildings, and there is one building remaining on the west or on the east side of the uh, of the project parcels. And then uh, there were four potential Native American sites that were identified uh, within that area as well. Um, because of that, a phase 1B uh, shovel test investigation was done for the project and uh, shovel test pits were dug uh, in the uh, anticipated disturbance area. Uh, and then in the areas where there was potential archeologically sensitive sites within that disturbance area, uh, they did uh, close interval testing. So they were uh, spaced the, uh, the intervals of, the, uh, of those test pits closer together. Uh, the result of the investigation was that there were no Native American artifacts or uh, potential features uh, identified. Uh, there was low frequency scatter of non-diagnostic artifacts, which are um, uh, you know, shards of glass, things like that, that have no characteristic features. Um, so because of that, uh, the Pan American uh, recommended that no further investigation was uh, required for the site. And uh, we received a letter from SHPO that they agreed and concurred with that, that no uh, further investigation was required for this site. That, uh, for the benefit of everybody listening, please uh, say what SHPO is. Uh, the State uh, Historic Preservation Office. Thank you. Um, and uh, they are currently reviewing the existing uh, photos that we gave them of the CCC building. Um, which we, we won't impact. It's about 750 feet east of our project. Um, so we're awaiting the, uh, their final letter of no impact. And we did a, uh, a traffic review of the, for the proposed project. So our driveway is connecting to Ellis Hollow Road and uh, the driveway will line up with Hungerford Hill Road uh, as requested by the, uh, the County Highway Department. Uh, Ellis Hollow Road is a designated truck route uh, so there'll be no impact to town roads uh, for this facility. Uh, access to the facility will be using uh, state and county owned uh, roadways. Um, the design uh, for the for the uh, transfer for the uh, traffic review was using a typical 100 uh, spectator game. Uh, it generates approximately 50 trips in and 50 trips out for a total of 100 trips. 
um, but only about 18 of those trips would be added during the uh, evening peak hour traffic. Uh, it'd be about two trips in and 16 out uh, during that peak time, uh, which would have no significant impacts to traffic. Um, Ellis Hollow Road is designed for uh, much higher volumes. Um, we have uh, contacted the county highway and they have uh, no concerns regarding uh, traffic from the facility. Uh, so for our, our project timeline, obviously we're uh, meeting with the planning board tonight to discuss uh, preliminary site plan, uh, seeker and a, a special permit. Uh, we realize that because it's a low density residential um, zoned area that the special permit would be required as part of the, the planning board review. Um, we're also requesting a waiver, uh, a parking waiver for a 20% reduction in the required parking from 100 spaces to 80 spaces. That's basically based on the anticipated use uh, for the facility. Uh, we're not seeking any variances. Um, and it's our understanding that the recent sign law was changed. So the scoreboard no longer needs a, uh, a sign permit. Uh, there were some previous uh, parameters set for this area for the Game Farm Road uh, by the town. Um, one regarding light and uh, the stadium will not, or there, there will be no stadium lighting associated with the field. Uh, so that should meet the town parameters for lighting. And uh, as far as sound, uh, the, the documents that we provided uh, show that the sound is attenuated by the design and that the sound would dissipate to, uh, to ambient levels um, uh, shortly after it passes the, uh, the perimeter of the facility and well within the, uh, the Cornell um, property area. Um, some of the other town uh, approvals and, and that we know that we need, uh, meeting with the Ithaca Public Works Committee in November, possibly in December as well. Um, these are our, our anticipated dates uh, to review the utilities, um, meeting with the town board uh, in December, possibly in, in January to discuss the uh, sewer extension, sanitary sewer. Um, and then, uh, you know, I tentative uh, final site plan approval uh, with the planning board in, in January, which would allow us to uh, start construction. January, in... January of 22, I assume. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that should be 22, yep. yep. Um, it allow us to, uh, to start construction in the spring of 22 uh, to finish up in the spring of uh, 23 uh, in time for baseball season. And uh, we know there's a couple, there's some other reviews uh, such as the, the County 239 review uh, as, as that was submitted to the county by the town. Uh, the SHPO, we, as we said, we're awaiting the uh, letter of no impact, uh, the, the county highway, uh, approval of the uh, access driveway, um, DEC uh, stormwater permit, um, are some of those uh, anticipated uh, reviews that we still, that we know, we understand we'll need. Um, so with that, I will uh, throw it back to David Cutter. I will quickly point out, we do have the county 239 review. I was going okay. to say that the 239 review letter is in the packet. Great. Yeah. Great. Great. So that's really, uh, hopefully provides you kind of a summary of where we're thinking in terms of this project here. And, you know, I guess at this point, I should probably stop sharing. And if you have questions at this point, or I'll let you get on with your agenda. Questions for the applicant from the um, planning board. Can the, um, I'm just a public person. Am I allowed to say, ask a question? Not yet. We will have a public hearing and there will be a formal opening of that public hearing. So if you could save your comments till that point. Will that be later tonight or some other time? Later tonight. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Cindy. Okay, great. I have a question for Jay. Hi, Jay. Um, the buildings look very nice, I think. I just had a couple of questions. Uh, the, the metal, the standing sea metal roof and corrugated um, so, um, side panels, are those white? Is that, is that the color, is that the accurate color that I'm seeing in the rendering? Great question, Cindy, nice to see you. Um, we are looking at a clear anodized aluminum so it would be very light, but it would not be a painted white color. It, it okay. would be, yeah, yeah, an anodized aluminum. Okay, great. And I did not see anything in the packet about the 
um, mechanical systems, maybe that hasn't been determined yet, but I wanted to understand, um, I, I, I see that there's space on the roof for future solar panels, I think, um, but will there be any rooftop units? No, there will not, there will not be any rooftop units. There is a space, um, just between the clubhouse and the batting facility uh, that we're gonna fence in to put the mechanical unit that provides heating and cooling to the, uh, to the building at grade. Um, so it's tucked away uh, to, on the north side uh, of the building, but no, no rooftop equipment. Okay. Um, do, will we get a chance to see how big that that area that that is holding the equipment is that is that indicated on the plan? I think it might, might be have... on the site plan, David. If you could bring that back up, um, I think it's an area not not more than twelve feet by twelve feet. Okay. Yep. I'll be with you in just a second here. Let me find the right place to share. It's really for condensing units, Cindy. We don't have, uh, you know, it's only a 5,000 square foot space and the training facility on the left okay. is, is not heated. Yeah. yeah, so it's just that little corral really that's fenced in with, uh, you know, six foot fencing and accessed off of the mechanical room, which is the dark gray yep. area inside the building. Okay, yeah. great. All right, thanks. Um, that takes care of my questions for now. Thank you. Great. And a question. Leva, if it's okay, I have a question. Um, Jay, could you just briefly describe for everyone the internal pieces of the building, the amenities, the, the bathrooms, the amenities of the locker room, those types of things that are being constructed for the teams and the public, just kind of um, general, just a general question. I don't need exact specifics, but just kind of have an, give us an idea of what's internal in the building. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Dan. Um, David, do you mind bringing that plan view back onto the screen? You right I'll, I'll start. I'll start off, Dan, by pointing out that it's not a public facility. Um, it's limited to to the to the Cornell baseball team for use uh, for Division One. Play. Um, so the building that has the um, public toilet rooms is connected to the press box and it's really only intended to be used during game day, right? It's just for the spectators in the stadium or in the seating to walk up um, and have access to the to men's and women's restroom. The clubhouse um, has that uh, yeah, bottom right corner, a kind of diagonal wall that brings you into the front doors through a vestibule. Um, and to the plan south, you go into the locker room area. Um, and off of that uh, are the, the showers um, and toilet facility for the team. To the right is where the training room is and the coaches offices are located there as well. And then north of that in the kind of aquamarine area is the team room uh, with seating focused on screens so that they can uh, examine a game. And then there's um, seating facing north out like I described towards the bullpen area and out towards the field. And a small conference room is connected. Yeah, just to the just to the right of that space. And then you go down a ramp or a couple of steps into the, um, the batting facility um, that's going to have bullpen pitching area and then three batting cages um, separated with netting. And again, roll up doors to access uh, the outside. Okay, thanks. And, and as far as the, the bathroom facility, what's the, what's the overall size of that facility? Um, in, in general, that the the, the spectators uh, would have access to. I mean, I, you know, it's driven by the um, 
international plumbing code requirement for that number of spectators or occupants in the space. So as, as you know, the, the number of fixtures for men is larger than, um, or no, I have it the other way around, right? It's uh, for women, it's more, and then you can do 50-50 with urinals. So I wanna say that there's roughly seven or eight fixtures in the men's room, um, that being larger. I don't know, David, if we have a plan view. Uh, maybe on the site plan, um, you can see that. Yeah, it doesn't really show Dan, the interior. Yeah. Okay. Dan, Dan, the the public hearing notice says 590 plus or minus square foot building with spectator bathrooms. That's correct. So, so 20 by 30, roughly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. I just wondered if I had a visual of you know, I don't want to get into specifics. Just the overall visual of the you know, number of fixtures and stuff. I mean, I got a good concept of the, the clubhouse and, and that type of thing. Um, just anyways, I, you answered my question and, and, and thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Can I follow up on that public use question, if I may? Sure. Um, and, and I'm not sure who's best to answer it. Um, in, in some of the materials, I think it's attached to the environmental assessment form. There's a statement the facility will provide the community with a new amenity, dot, dot, dot. Well, that's great. Thank you very much. But then in, then in the letter to Sue Ritter uh, from Mike Mantell, he says clearly, as has been stated in this meeting, in order to protect the condition of the facility, it will not be available for public use. So my, my question is, which is it, number one? In one sense, you say, it's an amenity, so therefore I would expect public use. Um, and furthermore, because um, I used to play on Hoyt Field, to be frank here, when I was playing organized baseball as a, as a young boy, I played on Hoyt Field, and uh, it was a privilege to play on Hoyt Field, and uh, I'm surprised Cornell uh, no longer supports the idea of allowing um, uh, boys and girls from, from playing baseball uh, on, their, on their wonderful facilities. So. Who wants to respond to what public use may be available as per the, the, the seeker information? Sure, I'll, I'll respond to that uh, as Dave Cutter. <clears throat> so in terms of amenity, I, I think it is meaning that uh, obviously as a spectator, it's open to the public. Anyone can come to that. It's not closed to just university members or, or students only. It's, you know, it's a public could come in and enjoy any of the games there as a spectator. Um, in terms of other uses, you know, it, it is a, it's a competition field, um, and obviously we're investing a lot in the system, so we're going to be careful of of how much use and and that it that it gets because we want to, you know, obviously maintain the quality of our investment here. That doesn't mean that we'll never allow others to use it. Um, if there is a situation where, say, Ithaca High School was in a jam and they couldn't use their field or they had a really special event or something, you know, we'd probably be happy to, to open it up for, you know, a high school game or something like that. It probably will be used, you know, a couple of times a year when they do recruiting for kind of that kind of uh, scouting games and that type of thing. But yeah, in terms of opening it up to club play, we won't, you know, we don't use, let our own recreational intramural sports would not be able to use it, and nor would the general public have general access to it. If that answers your question. Yeah, it does, unfortunately. I, I, <laughs> I know it's kind of sad, isn't it? It is. I mean, as a, as a 13, 14, 15 year old boy, I mean, that was a highlight to play on, to play on white field um, way back, way back when. Um, one more question, if I may. Um, and uh, this gets Dan Tate, you might want to help out here. Um, there's a lot of discussion about sewerage and dealing with sewerage and things like that. And I'm thinking going, wait a minute, we're just moving, we're just moving the sewerage from one place to another. It's not like we're adding anything to the system. It's just coming from a slightly different point. So I, I'm wondering why there's this need for calculations and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that, we're not adding anything to the system, as far as I can tell. What am I missing? Well, I think maybe what you're thinking of is um, when the waste hits the wastewater treatment plant, the, the, the big crux is what, what, 
how is the waste getting there? And the Hoy field that's currently within the city on Cornell campus is, is taking a different path than it is by relocating it up at Game Farm and in and, and, uh, Ellis Hollow Road. So um, okay. it, it, if that answers your question. Is this the is this the, the Mitchell Street capacity problem that we might have heard about when um, Maplewood was being built or something? Um, not necessarily. Um, on a side note, Maplewood, the issue there was the East State Street interceptor, um, okay. which is done in the city. Um, Maplewood comes in from a different direction than this facility would come in. Okay. Okay. So. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Marty? I uh, just wanted to clarify that uh, the applicant indicated that there was no variances that are being sought. Um, they're probably not aware of this at this point in time because I did not comment officially on this yet, but the fences do exceed the height limitation. So more than less, they would probably be required to obtain some variances for the fences that they're proposing as it stands. Good. Thanks for sharing that with us. Yeah, we didn't catch that. Question is, will an eight-foot fence keep a deer out? <laughs> think about it. I don't think the deer will be too interested in the artificial turf, we hope. We hope. Yeah. <laughs> it's green, though. It's true. And the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. Yeah. All right. Other questions from the planning board? Greg. Yeah, just a, uh, just a quick question and a comment. Uh, I understand from communication received today that uh, there, is, there will be no concessions whatsoever that'll be, uh, that'll be served on the premises. That's, no that's correct. Yeah, there's no concession stand or anything like that. That's correct, yep. So I guess it, the, the observation from that would be that uh, you know, I'm kind of dovetailing into Fred's comment is, is that it's a, community asset and you're inviting community members in to watch the game, yet they can't purchase a hot dog or a soda while they're sitting there watching a uh, seven to nine inning game. That's true. You have to pack in your own snacks and your drinks as well. I mean, it goes against, you know, the, I guess, you know, the premises of baseball and, and observing <laughs> sporting events. I will say that's the way Hawaii Field has been, is and has been for many years as well. That's the way it has been on campus. I should make a right. <laughs> True enough. Yeah, we're also going to lose the parking garage, which was a great place to view a baseball game from. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? or snarky comments. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess my, my comment falls under the snarky. Um, <laughs> I, this project um, is um, a dilemma to me because, you know, we're talking about uh, a fancy baseball field with a 15,000 foot um, field house and 500 seats and maybe 100 people if you're lucky, are going to come and see these games 10 times a year. And I, I've lived in this community for a long time. I've never seen any notices to the public at all to come and watch um, Cornell baseball. Maybe I just missed it, but I've never seen them. And um, so I, I just, this is kind of, a, I don't know, it's a, it's a dilemma to me because I can't figure out exactly why it's so big. I, I think at one point you described to us that it had to be 500 seats because it's a NACC, mm -hmm. whatever. It's a division <laughs> one field. So in order yeah. to meet the requirements, yeah. yeah. I, 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 I just, I, I don't, I'd love to know where that comes from because I think when Kate Supron mentioned that at, uh, at Site Plan Review, I kind of asked her, huh, where did that come from? Yeah, actually, yeah, I, I, I can respond to that. Actually, we did del delve deeper into that, Fred, after you, you know, had asked that. Yeah. And we couldn't find it in writing anywhere that it is a requirement by NCAA um, as for Division I. Um, on the other hand, we also surveyed kind of all our peer institutions. And that seems to be based more a planning principle that they use. Um, but it varies greatly from one to another. I mean, 
Yale has a huge facility for theirs. And, you know, so we're actually, the 500 seats is actually in the small size for most of our Ivy League competitors, but we see no reason why it needs to be any bigger. Yeah, I think um, you, I think you, in the, the, the materials, and let me, let me not forget to thank the applicant team for the materials. We got a lot of information and I truly appreciate that. But we even got an explanation of what the NCAA recommends for distances down the left and right field poles at center field, and that this field is going to be shorter than that, whether it's 12 feet down the poles or 10 feet to center. So it, it, it seems to me that, that the NCAA might have recommendations with regard to seating, but I certainly don't think that they would, 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 would delegate us a, a certain amount or a minimum amount in this case. Was there some discussion that the current seating is being moved from the existing white field to the new lo proposed new location? Do I we remember might, seeing that? Yeah, we, we might have mentioned that very early on as a possibility that, that that's not going to be the case. It yeah. doesn't really work with the layout that we that this field has. So okay. yeah, that'll be new. All right. Okay. So it may be up for sale. <laughs> All right. Um, and Yvonne, you know, we don't see much of anything about women's softball games or, you know, when's the next polo event at Oxley Arena, you know, if it's not basketball, hockey, football, and, and, and men's lacrosse, you know, you just, you just don't see much or hear much. Though, as I've, I've said before, Kenny Van Sickle is rolling over in his grave right now. So for those who remember Kenny Van Sickle. Well, I'm thinking that I'm um, I'm thinking about the movie Field of Dreams, and maybe if you build it, they will come, and <laughs> and perhaps you know it's it's kind of more accessible to people in the community. People can see it now when they drive by, and maybe there will be more of a public attendance, which could be nice for the community. Yeah. I'm sure the right. players we like, we like winners, don't we? <laughs> 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 yes. So um, along that line of thinking, it would be lovely if there was some kind of a some signage that says when the games are happening. So that community would know that and could attend. And Does bring that their have to go through a sign law piece. <laughs> As we say signage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I'm in favor of more signage. <laughs> Well, I think it would be really nice to let the community know when the games are happening. You know what? To be perfectly honest, if you are a Cornell baseball fan or an Ithaca College baseball fan, or frankly, a, a women's softball fan, you know where to look and you know where to find where the games are being held and when. Um, so if that's your if, if, if that's the entertainment you seek, you know where to look and you keep track of it. And I think the issue would be attracting new fans or the casual fan. Right, like me. Yeah. <laughs> so it would be nice to know when, when the games were happening. Yeah. It is all, right. all listed on the Cornell Athletics website. All home games are listed. Okay. Times. Yep. Okay. So uh, with that then, let us turn our attention to the actual form itself. So for members of the public who are holding on, just to explain the process here a little bit, we're going to review the form, um, the seeker form, and then uh, assess um, whether or not there is a um, negative determination for this project. After that seeker uh, process, we will then open up um, to the public hearing. And then after the public hearing, we will review the uh, second motion on um, preliminary approval. Okay, so form. Chris. I have several changes um, based on Marty's discovery of variances. Um, and also Susan Brock had some suggested changes. And, um, and I can go last or I can go first if other board members wanna make changes. Why don't you go first? Yay, okay. We are going to start with page two. Now I'm not working from a PDF. 
I'm working from the actual form physically in my hand and the physical form, page two of part one, we need to add a couple of things underneath governmental approvals, which is section B. Um, under Ariel, I think this is virtual page 38. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to leave it up to you all to track the virtual. Um, under the town board approval, the sewer extension, we need to add Mitchell Street sanitary sewer upgrade. And I will make the changes, it, it, whatever the board agrees with, I will make the changes to the original and then Liba, you can come into town hall and sign the, the seekers, which they're piling up by the way. I was gonna ask you, let's talk about this at the end. <laughs> yeah, you'll have quite a few. Um, okay, and then underneath the governmental entity, uh, city, town or village planning board, uh, site plan seeker and special permit needs to be added, special permit does. Um, under the Zoning Board of Appeals, we have to check yes instead of no. And then we need to say ZBA area variances for, and Marty, correct me if I'm wrong, fence and backstop netting. Yeah, that would be correct. I believe they would all be fences in that respect. Okay, so should I just say fences? Yes. Okay. Okay, that's one. How's the board feel about that? This is great. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to page, physical page five. It is the section at the very end of the page, uh, page five of 13, related to wastewater treatment facilities, the name of the district. They put Ithaca Sewer District, and we need to change that, strike that, and change it to Town of Ithaca Sewer Improvement Area. And there's nothing on our end until the part three, which is the text attachment. Um, I don't know what page this will be in the virtual. But it's after all of the legal looking forms and it's just a word document at the end. Part three, evaluation of the magnitude and importance of project impacts and determination of significance. I have two, I have one involved agency listed. The Town of Ithaca Planning Board's the lead agency. Um, I, I have Town of Ithaca Town Board listed as an involved agency. I need to add the Town of Ithaca Zoning Board of Appeals. And this is related to the variances. So then under the description, the second paragraph, it says the planning board will consider granting site plan approval and special permit for the project. The town board will consider accepting a new sanitary sewer main associated with the project, which may also involve upgrades to a sewer in interceptor located on Mitchell Street. I would like to add the sentence, the zoning board of appeals will consider granting area variances for the proposed fences. Along the same lines, we go to um, number nine, impact on aesthetic resources. I will just read the first two lines. The proposed baseball field will be located within a previously farmed meadow surrounded by meadow and shrubs. The nearest development is almost a half a mile away at East Hill Plaza. The new field, insert, comma, and proposed fences, sorry, the new field, comma, proposed fences, comma, and associated structures. And then that's that. The sentence would read, the new field, comma, proposed fences, comma, and associated structures will be visible from Ellis Hollow Road and Game Farm Road year round. Then for the benefit of the public, um, the town of Ithaca and Tompkins County have established scenic resources inventories that identify scenic views in the East Hill Cornell area. The town's inventory does identify the corner of Ellis Hollow and Game Farm Roads as noteworthy. However, the, new view, the view is not considered significant and therefore was not included in the list of significant views to protect. 
there are no other identified scenic resources around the project site that would be impacted by the proposed development. Okay. Under the section on the next page, number 13, impact on transportation, I was under the impression that the in applicant intended to move the existing bleachers from the existing Hoy field to the new field. So um, do I understand now that you're not gonna move the existing bleachers? You're gonna set up a whole new set of 500 seat bleachers? That is correct. Okay, well then I, we need to get rid of that sentence. Um, well, no, I think we should leave, I, should, I think we should leave it as the applicant Okay. And then cross out intends to move dot 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 the project site. The applicant asserts that only 80 parking spaces will be required for spectators. I think we need to leave that in. Okay. Um, I had a real problem with that because to call that 500 seat NCAA bleachers just said chills up my spine. They're not NCAA bleachers, you know, they're just bleachers. But that's all, that's all gonna go now. Excellent. Thank yeah. you, Fred. Yeah. Okay. Um, finally, I know you're all riveted. Uh, on the very last page of this analysis on part three, just before the staff recommendation and determination of significance, I wanna add a little bit more about the zoning board variances. So above the line that says based on the above information, I would like to insert the proposed fencing for the project will require area variances by the ZBA, or we can say Zoning Board of Appeals. As noted in the aesthetics section, the fencing will be visible from East, um, sorry, Ellis Hollow Road and Game Farm Road year round. However, this view is not considered a significant view to protect for the town of Ithaca Scenic Resources Inventory. That's just suggested language I came up with on the fly. If you don't like it, we can change it. That's all I had. Other questions, comments? So I had a quick question here, and, and this comes up in the part three also. Um, on noise and the materials oh. indicate that the noise would be significantly reduced at property limits, but I have no idea how that's happening. Right. Um, does the applicant have an idea? So the app, so we brought this up at the staff level and this is on physical form. Um, uh, I have it on virtual page 56 is in okay. within Cornell's documents itself and then on virtual page 75 is the within the, the part three analysis. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the sound ease model drawing uh, shows that the sound drops off to 65 or 69 decibels but it doesn't really extend much farther than that. And mm -hmm. I think um, the reason why we flagged this is because we have had other projects come to our planning board recently that have asserted 65 decibel levels and that has been a little bit too much for the board. And, and um, so the board has asked for um, sound enclosures, but that's for actual noise studies. This isn't a noise study. I think it would be fair to ask if the planning board asks the applicant to provide um, some sort of evidence that when the sound reaches Game Farm Road, it will not reach above a certain decibel level. And the World Health Organization has said that a 50 decibel level uh, is considered um, normal talking during in a suburban setting. So could the applicant prove that it won't be more than 50 decibels at Game Farm Road, for example. Yeah, we, we could extend the, the, the boundary of the study to go basically to the, the Game Farm Road property line or whatever, prop, you know, in all directions to, to the, the property lines to determine what the decibel level would be out there. My seat of my pit guess is that we'll, we'll definitely be well below the 50 decibels by that point, just because of the distance. But we, yeah, we'd be glad to, finish that study to go out that further. 
Yeah, I Thank believe the, the thought was that it was around 65 was the ambient noise level for the area. And I think that's why it ended there, but I'm sure it could be extended. Fred, you look like you were gonna say something. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm noodling this through in my head. Seeker requires us to make a determination about the potential for significant environmental impacts. And if we make the determination that um, there is not the potential for significant environmental impacts, then we're making the assumption that a more, a, a greater noise level examination uh, will justify that, that, that opinion or that vote right now. Um, I'm trying to decide whether I'm comfortable with that. Um, um, it's almost sounding like a, you know, a conditional <laughs> de negative declaration. You know, it's 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 not going to have a significant. It doesn't have the potential for significant environmental impacts if the subsequent, you know, a sound evaluation comes back as expected. Um, that's what I'm noodling around and why I'm making faces right now. I agree, Susan. Um. So the noise is coming from the amplified, the, amp, the, the speaker system, right? Mm -hmm. That's only going to be operational during games. So that's about 11 times a year for two hours during daylight hours. Called three, this is baseball game. Mm -hmm. They're slow. Oh, oh, that's true, I'm sorry, you're right, yeah. it's baseball. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so even if, um, you know, the noise did exceed ambient noise at the property line, given the short duration and a relative infrequency of the events um, during daylight hours, could that rise to a potential for a significant adverse environmental impact? You make, you make, a, it, good, you make, you make a good point. Right. Make Is it significant? Point. And um you know, I think uh, th that's the issue. So yeah, I'll just stop right there. Okay. Can I ask a member of the Cornell team to do me a favor right now and go to the Cornell Athletics website and tell me how many home games Cornell men's baseball has in the upcoming spring season? I'm hearing these numbers of low teens. And for some reason, I'm thinking it's got to be closer to 20. Um, so I'd like a I'd like a better number. So can someone go and look what's coming up in the 21, 22 season? I can take a shot. I'm not I'm sure it's thinking, up there yet. Just thinking men's baseball plays 35, 40 games. And if they play weather permitting, of course, this is the Northeast. And, you know, when you play 35, 40 games, there's at least to me an expectation that roughly half of them would be uh, on your home field. So I'm thinking that 10 or 12 was kind of low, 14 is kind of low that you're, You'd be closer to 20 home games. I think the 10 and 12 is is number of times we'd have events out there. A lot of times we have double header games because absolutely on the weekend, absolutely right. yep. a lot of double headers. So that yep. means you're not playing for three hours. That means you're playing for six hours, for hey, example. Fred, the 2020 schedule, it looked like they played 13 home games. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So Thank we, you. Yep. Do we have can you look at the 2022 schedule? Is it available yet? No, it just has twenty twenty. Okay. okay, okay, but thank you. But you're right. There are there are double headers on the weekends. That's that's pretty common, and certainly in Ivy League baseball. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Susan Brock. Appreciate that. Yeah, I did the quick math on that for eleven games. That's roughly three percent of the calendar days. Um, in any case, so any other questions? All right, I'm uh, seeing none. Okay, um, I would like to move forward then with a motion of negative determination for the seeker resolution. So moved. Second, Cindy, thank you. Um, any comments, changes, questions on the... Uh, Resolution itself. I'm sorry, I have to flip documents here. 
Chris, Susan, nothing? Okay, perfect. Uh, Margaret, you're voting on this. Uh, so all those in favor, please signal by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstained? All right, motion passes. At 8.33 p.m. Uh, Yvonne, you're, you're muted. I think Yvonne is trying to say something. Oh, whoops, sorry. I abstain. Thank you for uh, saying that Yvonne abstains. Yeah. All right. Um, so at 8.33 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. PM, how many did, how many in favor? Is that four in favor then? Five in favor, one, two, three, four. Okay, five, yep, thank you, okay. Um, all at, right. At six. Six. Six, um, we have seven planning board members in attendance, right? Yep, mm -hmm. okay. So it's yes. six, the vote is six, zero, one. Correct. All right, um, so at 8.34 p.m., I'd like to open the public hearing on this matter. Hello, uh, I'd like to speak if that's possible. All right, so I'm going to, I see hands coming up and I cannot see hands for phone people first. So let me take one of my um, phone callers and then if uh, those who have video can put their hands up, their um uh, reaction hand up so then I can I can call on you in succession. Um, so Kyra, I see that you would like to speak. I will get you on board shortly. Um, who is our first phone caller who is requesting to speak? Hello? Hello? Yep, go ahead. Okay. Um, my name is Pat Holmes, and I am uh, a resident on Ellis Hollow, actually right across from Game Farm Road. So um, we were somewhat uh, anxious when we received your letter, um, not really understanding what all the parcel numbers meant. Um, we've tried to uh, understand by listening to you tonight. We tried to get on Zoom, but we couldn't make it on either of our computers. So... Um, we're thinking that we know where it is, but we wondered if there was any possibility of a small plan being available um, to, to send to us or for us to look into the... We looked at all your emails and we couldn't get in and find anything um, that showed us exactly what you were talking about, but we think we have it plan uh, in our minds now. Because as you can imagine, we're very concerned, particularly as we're right across from Game Farm, but as we understand your planning, it looks like your major traffic now will be coming more from Hungerford because, of course, Game Farm and Ellis Hollow is a very busy corner. And um, so we were concerned about that. But is there any way that we could see a map of what that whole area is going to look like with the soccer fields and everything? Chris, would you like to answer that? Yeah. Um Pat, do you have access to your computer? You said that you can't get on the yeah. Zoom, but okay. So all I of these I couldn't when I put all the information in that you gave us in this letter. Um, I couldn't. It didn't come up. Um, Got it. You know, um, it, it, uh, it invalid. Invalid is what it said. Mm. And we tried a different computer, and that said the same thing. I'm sorry about that. Um, if you were able to go to the town of Ithaca's website. You can access yeah. all of the project materials by, and I'm going to do that right now so I can guide mm -hmm. you. So you go to Town of Ithaca, and then there's a yeah. menu bar at the top that says boards and committees. You, you click on planning board, and then you click on agendas, and it's on the page under, it says agendas with planning board meeting materials and minutes. Thank you. Now, one of the other things no, how, many, how many pages? Well, there's more than that though. Then, then you would need to click on planning board, scroll down to the packet for the 10-19-2021 meeting. You can view the materials or download them. And Fred, they are 83 pages long. 
Yes, that's for that's oh, for right. benefit. I don't think I'll download, <laughs> but I will look. Um, and if, if you're I going have to noticed, view, uh, sorry, if yeah, you're I going just want to, to see what the situation is, the placement. Uh, I have noticed as I've driven along several little what looks like white tents uh, stuck up in different places over in the corner, uh, way across from the from the soccer. And I wondered if that was sort of a beginning planning space, you know, how you looked at what you were about to build. But I'm not sure. N nobody I, knows what I'm talking about, so forget I, it, right? I can't, I can't um, answer that. Okay, we do have one other question here from another resident. Just one second. Do you have any idea what this is going to do to our property value? Well, it might improve them. Um, I really doubt that. I mean, we were looking out on open fields before. Now we're going to be looking out on 15,000-foot buildings and fences. Nobody can comment on this. So, I as mean, a planning Cornell board, we, do we don't have anything to. As a planning value. board, we don't have anything to do with property value. Our job is to ask: Has there been an impact, a significant environmental impact? And property value is not listed as a significant environmental impact. Well, we're past, we're past we're past the environmental piece, and we're now on to site plan and special permit. So, um, you know, you do look at, is it consistent with the character of the surrounding community? And or is there gonna be an impact on uh, aesthetic resources and things like that? Um, David Cutter, maybe you can, or somebody else on your team can respond at least as far as um, how far off. Of, so it sounds like these callers are maybe on Ellis mm -hmm. Hollow Road. How far yeah. away from how Ellis where Hollow our Road? driveway is actually a continuation <clears throat> of Game Farm Road. If you were to continue up Game Farm, you'd come right up our driveway. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe you could um, tell them how many feet you are away. And also, I think in the materials there was some discussion about topography, and maybe this is lower uh, than the roads. I, am I remembering right. that correctly? Can you see. maybe yeah. that would be? Yeah, I mean. I don't know yeah, even me, if that would be appropriate for them to say right now. We're higher than the road. Right. Yeah. Let me jump in here for a second just to, to give you a few numbers any way to maybe that'll help. So if I was to draw a straight line from that intersection of Game Farm Road where it intersects with Ellis Hollow to more or less the center of where the, the baseball field would be, it's probably about mm -hmm. 1,500 feet. Um, out of that, probably maybe close to a thousand of that feet is going to be the existing fields that are at the high part there. And then the field itself is actually set down. If you can imagine kind of scooping out to level off the, the slope there, the field is actually set down kind of below and scooped into the slope. So it's, it's not, we're not filling up and raising it up, it's actually setting it down. So your, your mm. house is probably gonna be 70 to 80 feet higher than what the highest part of our, our fields are. So you, you will still have a, a pretty clear view across fields to the, the, the woods in Cascadilla Creek and kind of that long row through there. Your and your foreground will be exactly the same too in terms of the fields that go along the edge of Ellis Hollow Road. It'll just be in kind of down lower in the middle ground is where the baseball field will be. If that if that helps mm -hmm. some. Okay, all right. Uh, the other thing is when people were talking about the noise. Uh, now those soccer fields are located directly across from us, but down a very long way. And we can still hear the noise from that. I mean, it's not unbearable by any means, but we can hear the noise from those fields when they're in use. Just so you know, I mean, I'm not complaining at all about it, but just so you know how the sound travels, we can hear that noise. Yeah, and we're hoping that the way that the sound is, is set up within our baseball fields if you can think of kind of a, of a cup facing away from you, it's actually the, 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 the speakers will be oriented, you know, away from you towards the field. So I would anticipate that 
it would certainly not be any worse than what you would get from the soccer fields and probably yeah. more. Like you've I said, a, that doesn't you know, bother us. Great. Okay, David, we should, David, we should point out that um, the, the, the purpose of the um, amplified sound is for the coaches, the teams, the umpires, and the fans that are all sitting right there behind home plate. There are no fans out along the first and third base lines. There are no fans in the outfield uh, per se. So there's no reason for this sound to be designed to carry a great distance. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you so thank very, you very much. much for your help. You're welcome. Thank you for calling thank in. Um, Kyra? Appreciate it, thank you. All right, I'd like to um, make two points. Um, my first is again with the noise. I can hear the soccer fields. I'm on um, Fox Hollow Road right behind, but Game Farm Road's maybe, oh, I'd say um, 100 feet away from my house. I hear the soccer fields very well and they're gonna be fewer people on the soccer fields than there will be in the baseball stadium. And I do think, I don't think you guys are being realistic in the fact that noise travels, especially if the wind's blowing the right way. I can actually hear the band playing on Cholkov Field from my house when the wind's blowing the right way. And that's much further away. So I think I am going to be impacted by the noise. And I don't think it's my quality of life will go down because your games were what, Saturday afternoons? And I'll hear the noise. The second thing is, I don't understand why you have to have a stadium seating of 500 people. It doesn't make sense. Uh, as a baseball player, I would think it'd be kind of weird playing in a half empty stadium. If you don't get 500 people, why have a stadium for 500 people? Can anybody answer that question? I think, as we mentioned before, it's based on kind of the, the basic guidelines of being an NCA double double or division one. Um, but you just said earlier program. that it wasn't a guideline. Someone said earlier in the meeting, there's no guideline written. It's in not a requirement. The, they put out guidelines, correct? Yep. Well, half empty stadium, if you're playing a half a, a empty stadium, as a player, I would think that feel weird. I'd rather have a smaller stadium full of people as a player, I'm, I was a varsity field hockey player at Penn. And believe me, you don't want to play in a half empty stadium. You want to have a full stadium. Of, it just feels better as a player. But my primary concern, I just think it's crazy to have that huge a stadium. But my pr primary concern is I'm going to be affected by the noise. And does anybody have any feedback on that? I don't think it's going to be 65 decimal bells at Game Farm Road. It's going to be a lot higher than that. All I can say is that's not that's not what our our noise study is, is showing. Well, how did, you, how did you do the noise study? I don't know. We had a noise consultant that provided the, the study. And how they so that was a contracted so that's a contracted service um, undertaken but, by Cornell. But how do they how do they conduct it? They have a model that they run based on the the speakers that they're using and you know topography and distance and they they run their model and that was the results that it was back to about sixty five decibels you know ambient noise um, you know. Well, well, with it, not not far beyond the, the the limits of our facility, and well within the property lines. And when people are screaming for a home run, I can hear the soccer players. There are far fewer soccer players on the fields than there will be in the baseball stadium, especially. And if the whole bunch of people are screaming when someone shoots a gets hits a home run, it's going to be noisy. So I think that's why we are having the discussion about how many home games there actually are and what what the impact of that would be. So what we can't do is prevent it, but we can mitigate. And how will you mitigate it? So I think that's why the noise study was was done to understand the volume of noise coming out from the speakers. Uh, you know, somebody cheering for a home run is not a continuous event. 
Yeah, but also uh, gunshots aren't continuous events either, and they're annoying too. I mean, it's just, it's sound pollution, basically. And I challenge you guys, after it's all built and there's a loudspeaker going and there's a crowd there, come to Game Farm and measure the decibels, and you'll find it'll be higher than 65. And I want that on record because it, it affects my life negatively. Understood. Thank you very much for speaking up. Um, this session is being recorded, so your, your um, comments are documented. Well, can somebody do a study after it's all built and find out what the noise will be? I uh, Susan, I'm going to look to you here. I don't know that is that within our purview to request or to condition. So um, you already have information right now about what the amplified noise levels are mm -hmm. at the field and just mm -hmm. a little bit beyond the limits of the field. Mm -hmm. um, you have information about the duration and frequency of the games. If you feel um, additional mitigation is needed, um, you'll need to you know, specify that either now or uh, they're getting preliminary. If, if you vote and if you get preliminary approval, but it's not the end. They right. would need to come back for final. So you can you know, reserve on whether more mitigation is needed on amplified noise. I don't think there's anything that you're you going to be able do to do so about people cheering, cheering for is not considered um, amplified 10 seconds, noise, correct. right, mm -hmm. during a home run event. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think anything can be done about that. There's no way to mitigate that. Um, so, yeah. Well, the orientation of the field could be separate, different. Well, I think the orientation of the field is set up to... Um, as head up, heading right towards my house, to be honest. <laughs> Um, okay, so anyway, Leva, I, this is probably my fault because I asked David Cutter to provide the distance information in response to the first comments. I think typically what we do during a public hearing is the public makes their comments, we don't respond immediately, and then once we close the public hearing, we ask um, if we need the applicant to give us, you know, some uh, information for responses, you know, we can ask then or, or board members can provide information to, or staff can provide information. But I think, um, yeah, this, this public hearing is not, um, it's probably my fault, the, the way this is going right now. So I would recommend we just go back to doing it the way we usually do it, which is we just take all the public comment and then we can have further discussion among the board and ask the applicant and staff for information as we need it to respond. Thank you will for the that, public, Susan. Will the public ever get feedback on this since I'm in the public? So after we close the public hearing, then we'll consider that we have, this is just a preliminary state. Should we um, proceed forward? There is a second um, point of, uh, of discussion and consideration. So uh, tonight is not the be all and end all of this discussion. Okay, well, I, I would appreciate getting some feedback on how you will mitigate the noise. I do think it's gonna negatively affect where I live. Thank you for that comment. So all of our discussions and determinations are made a uh, public record. And so you would be able to find that information also on the town of Ithaca um, website. You'll see all of our mini meeting minutes there um, and, uh, and comments there. All right. Bruce. There we go. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I looked at the site, there's opportunities and there are constraints. One of the opportunities is the space. It's a big open area. And yet this plan, as I look at it, looks like it's designed to waste as much space as possible. And I couldn't understand. So I looked up the Game Farm Athletic Field Master Plan and this has nothing to do with the master plan for that area. Now, a new master plan was presented tonight, and this does sort of fit into that, but it still looks like it's just squandering space. Space, right now, that south side field looks huge. In 30 years, it's going to be crowded. So I would think use it as wisely as you can. Um, 
Another opportunity is to make the field regulation size. The current Hoy field is, it's in a very constrained area. It's not regulation size. Here you've got the opportunity and it's not being done. And I can't understand that. The, the, the material says, well, it's not a requirement. And so we're just gonna go with a, a off size field. Another opportunity, shared facilities. You've got the existing soccer fields with parking and bathrooms, and these two are completely disconnected. And I think the answer is, well, one of them's intercollegiate and the other's intramural, and you couldn't possibly share a bathroom between those two, or you couldn't share parking between these two uses. They're not gonna be used at the same time. You've got a chance. You, share facilities there. Constraints, the overhead electric wires, what's the best use of that space? The new master plan that was shown tonight looked like it had parking and a road, that makes sense because you can't put buildings under them. So, so that I was pleased with. Other people have mentioned this, I'm gonna bring it up too. 80 parking spaces, 500 seats. I'm having difficulty with this math the 500 seats and bathrooms to accommodate 500 people. You're never going to get them. Why do it? The, oh, it's typical or it's a guideline. So I can't understand. You've got this oh, typical guideline and we're gonna be forced to have 500 seats and 500 bathrooms for 500. And yet, the recommended field size, ah, who cares? You know, we'll just have this odd size field. And maybe it's just because that way we can win home games because all the, the away teams will have no idea how big our field is. But you've got the opportunity, make it a regulation size field. Um, buses, there wasn't bus parking before and now there is from June but I really did not see a bus loading, unloading area. The turnaround at the end of that drive is tight. And there was a, a diagram showing that a fire truck can make it barely, but the buses are gonna have trouble turning around. And especially if there are, the only way that the fire truck can do it is if it gets lined up right. If there's a car unloading and a bus has to go around it, the bus won't be able to make the corner at the end. Make it a little bigger. You've got the space, do it. And then the final is a question, which I understand we won't get an answer to now, but the, the layout, the house plan of the, the clubhouse showed lockers. We were shown lockers and showers for the team. And I'm wondering, what about the visitors? Are they just gonna get sweaty and jammed back on their bus and go home in their uniforms? Is there a uh, lockers and showers for both teams? Do they share after a rough game? Are they gonna be in there beating each other up? So that's a question I, we don't have to answer that during the public hearing, but I, that was, that's it for me. So thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> I too had a question about the visiting team. I was surprised that I didn't see visiting team facilities in that, in the clubhouse. Um, so where do we wanna go from here now? Anybody else to speak? Um, not seeing anyone indicating that. So at uh, 8.57 then, I will close the public hearing. Um, all right, so we've gotten a bunch of feedback at this point. Dear board, how would we like to make use of this feedback? Well, obviously the noise study will be important. Uh, mm -hmm. There's no doubt about that given given the comments. We're, and these are comments I think we expected from mm -hmm. the, the few comments we got back uh, when uh, we had the sketch plan review. Um, let me respond to Bruce briefly. Your, your, most of your complaints are about Cordell University and you know the fact that the, maybe they're squandering their open space up there. 
Um, I'm not sure it's the planning board's job to, to tell Cornell University to use their space more efficiently. I'm not sure whether we have that power or that we have the expertise. Um, you know, it's their land. And um, uh, obviously there are cons constraints imposed by town law or state law or, or, or county regulations, but um, um, we should congratulate them for positioning it a far away from uh, the intersection of uh, Ellis Hollow Road and Game Farm Road and, and, and also uh, aligning it in a way that is beneficial to the baseball players themselves, keep the sun out of their eyes, but also direct the sound you know, towards the soccer fields and away from where most of the people live. So um, if they want to you know, shoot themselves in the foot 10 or 20 years down the road when upper alumni fields get moved out or you know, other athletic facilities, the soccer field uh, has to, the, the actual competitive soccer field has to be moved out there. You know, that's, that's their problem. It's, it's not my problem. Um, so uh, that's my response to that. Um, we're getting a little silly about the, the 318 feet down the line instead of 330. I mean, I brought that up. You brought it up. Um, you know, they can do what they want there. I, that's, that's not a planning board issue as far as I'm concerned. It's noise. It's the potential for noise. It's the potential for amplified noise that reaches a certain level and stays at that level. The fact that it momentarily increases to 60 or 62 or 63 decibels and comes back down is not the issue. The question is, does it stay at a high level, which is annoying? And uh, hopefully we'll get uh, some more. And no, not hopefully. We will get some more information about that um, before they come back for uh, any further approval. So we'll see. I should point out the draft resolution did have a condition with regard to uh, additional sound analysis that it was already uh, thought through, I think. Yeah, I was just about to, to turn to that here. Yeah, yeah, that was already included in our draft. So if we turn our attention to the draft resolution uh, for preliminary site plan approval and special permit, are there any changes, modifications, or adjustments or additions that plan planning board members would like to see on this or staff? Um, Dan, Dan Tate is still here. Um, Dan, condition C, 2C says blah, 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 stating that the Ithaca Wastewater Treatment Facility has adequate capacity to treat Again, I don't think that's the issue, is it? It's not that the treatment plan has adequate capacity because we're not adding capacity. We're simply moving it from one place to another. It is. Um, it's, a, it's a requirement of all development that they seek that through the plan. So okay. it's a matter of just paperwork. I understand what you're saying. Um, okay. Technically, the flow is coming from the city at the current time. Mm -hmm. Now it's going to be coming from the town. So the allocation does slightly change. It's more of a record keeping issue. Okay. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, D right below that showing uh, measuring sound levels uh, to property limits on Game Farm Road. And I think we should add and Ellis Hollow Road um, would be appropriate. And then uh, G says before the issuance of building permits, Submission of documentation to the Town Engineering Department of New York State DEC approval. DEC approval of what? I'm so glad you said that, Fred, because okay. that's one of the additions that staff wants to add. Oh, okay, okay. That's all. That's all I have. So, was that a question? I mean, Chris. I... No, I have an answer for that. Well, yeah, I mean, one of the one of the approvals they do need is for the sewer main extension. Um, that is something that requires a DEC approval. Right. And that's what that's what Susan Brock had recommended that we add to the end of G. That it says, before the issuance of building permits, the submission of documentation to the Town Engineering Department of New York State DEC approval of the sanitary sewer extension. Thank you. I had a question about D. It says uh, 
sound analysis relative to the proposed PA system, I think the concern from the public was peak noise for crowd cheering. And what are we going to do about crowd cheering? We're going to put up signs that say you can't cheer. <laughs> you know, you know, spirit, spirit fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, right. the, the reason why I'm I wrote that condition to be specific to the PA system is because the all of the relative application materials refer to the actual PA system and the decibel levels that will be emit from the PA system. And the sound analysis that was done was relative to the PA system. All right, gotcha. So there's, yeah. So I'm going to push this a little bit because um, I'm kind of wondering too, is there any way to model what crowd cheering actually looks like and sounds like? Is it worthwhile knowing? Is it over the edge? Well, that raises the question. If they model it, let's say they can, mm -hmm. and, 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 and we look at the results, what are we going to do with the results? Yeah, you know, no, I totally you know, hear you. <laughs> again, we could put up signage and ask people not to cheer loudly or, mm -hmm. you know, you know, I mean, I, this is kind of like human nature, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I thought I'd ask because I yeah. was inquiring. <laughs> yeah, I think amplified sound is important. I think we're dealing with it. Uh, we're dealing with it appropriately. Chris, did you have other changes for the form? Of course. Yes, um, for the proposed resolution, yes. Um, so if I get something wrong, Susan Brock, I'm looking to you um, because you had provided some emails and I'm not sure I got everything correct. So um, the very first suggested change is not in the conditions, but is on page two of the resolution where it talks about special permit. And it is big letter D, community infrastructure and services. And the bullet that says Cornell will be utilizing their own infrastructure, yada, yada. Uh, we have some suggested wording changes as follows. Cornell will be utilizing their own, and then insert the word water infrastructure comma, strike and services, all of, and continue with, and I will read all of this at the end, by the way, which strike is, or sorry, strike R, change it to is, of adequate capacity to accommodate the proposed use. So that sentence would read, Cornell will be utilizing their own water infrastructure, which is of adequate capacity to accommodate the proposed use. Then, insert the sentence, Cornell will build and dedicate to the town a sewer extension from Summerhill Lane to the project site. And then we continue the, get rid of the words proposed new and instead say existing Mitchell Street, town sanitary sewer main will require an upgrade. And then no changes after that, et cetera, et cetera. Can we change MOU to what Memorandum of Understanding. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And also, there's another place too where we where we have MOU. I mean, at least spell it out in the first place, and then you can abbreviate it later on. Yeah, that's legit. Okay. Thank you. Um, may I move on? Okay. Uh, under big letter F, the site layout, the bullet that says the access drive and parking lot uh, change has to have been safely designed for emergency vehicles and either have been or cross out will and say must be approved by the codes department and the Ithaca Fire Department before final site plan approval. Under big letter G, um, I recommend that we get rid of the entire line that says there will be no real vegetation loss associated with the project and, and just start the sentence with the nearest land use is a soccer field. I think Susan, you had suggested that we state that the existing vegetation is preserved. I, I think that's obvious. 
So. That's fine, Chris. Your changes are fine. Okay. I mean, you can, you can argue with anything. I'm good with it. Um, okay. And then when we move on to the conditions of approval, condition A, actually that's Fred, Fred that's where I had originally thought that I wrote memorandum. But yeah, you did there. First. Yeah. Yeah. You did. Yeah. <laughs> Cause that's, I forgot that I wrote it above. Yeah. All right. But under that condition, the very last um, line, instead of saying the town attorney, we'll change that to the attorney for the town. That's just consistency on our resolutions. And then, um, gosh, I thought, I, I love how, you know, I set up these resolutions so everything goes chronologically. So this is what they have to do before final, before, before issuance of the building permits, before CFOs. But now that we need to get zoning board variances, we need to add a new K that says before final site plan approval, granting of any necessary variances by the Zoning Board of Appeals. And finally, I think Susan, you had, or Dave O'Shea had an additional condition related to easements. And I don't know if that replaces an existing condition or if it's a new condition. If you could- No, it's a new condition, which would be, uh, before the issuance of any building permits, approval by the town board, comma, full execution and filing of a sanitary sewer easement with an S in parentheses, um, granted to the town of Ithaca by the applicant and by the relevant property owner to the West, semicolon, such easement, parentheses S, shall be satisfactory to the attorney for the town and the town of Ithaca Public Works Department because they're proposing to dedicate um, the sewer extension to the town and the town will need an easement um, from the relevant property owners to accompany that dedication. Is that so gonna go that, across Summer Hill property? Pardon? Is it gonna run across Summer Hill's property a little bit? Um, I don't know who the property owner is. Okay, so okay. That would be uh, Dan Tate or Dave O'Shea. Okay, but that, that. that's why it's written the way, that's why you're proposing to the, the verbiage that you are just in case, okay. So this is just something we always require. Yeah. Um, this is not an unusual condition at all. This is normal and yeah. Yeah, Fred, our town on sewer main ends at uh, Summer Hill Road. Okay. So um, whatever path they determine and, and, and negotiate with the adjoining property owners, that's the yeah. path that'll be taken, obviously mm -hmm. with our approval, so. Right, so it'll, it has to leave their property and, and go on to a neighbor's property. That's correct. In order to get to the main. Okay, good, thank you. And I'll email this language to Chris and Paulette. Um, does anybody want me to read it again or did that make sense to everybody? All right, sounds like everybody's good with that one. Any other questions, changes or additions? With that, then, can I have a motion for preliminary site plan approval and special permit of the Cornell New Baseball Field? So moved. Greg? Chair seconds. Those Thank in favor, by, please signal by saying aye. 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 All those uh, opposed? And any abstentions? All right, motion passes. Wait, wait, Leva, could you clarify who moved that? Was it Cindy or Fred? It was moved by Greg, seconded right. by the oh. chair. Oh, right, okay. Second. All right. Okie dokie. Next agenda item here. So thank you all for participating. Um, I greatly appreciate your involvement. Mm -hmm. Well, thank now, you. Yep. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So our next agenda item here, if I can find my agenda, um, are there any individuals to be heard on matters that um, were not discussed already this evening?
Anybody there, Paula? I don't see. No, I don't see anybody. And I have not received any emails. Okay. Thank you. So then I will move on to the next item. Um, minutes for October 5th. I see that in the packet, but I could have missed that. Did I miss I, it? I don't I don't remember seeing any minutes. Okay. Yeah, there weren't any. Okay. I didn't think so. All right. So maybe we'll have those available for us next time. Um, other business. We've got more meetings, I'm going to presume. Oh, Sue, so, so do you want to say stuff before I mention what's no, you can mention that and then I have a report. Okay. Um, yeah, we do have a meeting next time. Um, there is one item on the agenda so far. Uh, that's probably the only thing. It's a um, it's sort of a two lot subdivision slash consolidation. Okay. Yes, so I, I won't be here. No, Fred. Okay. That's November two, right? Yeah. That is November second. Yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll be I'll be out of the country. Okay. I'll I will be out of town, but I could join the meeting from out of town if we don't have a quorum. I'll, so, I'll be on vacation, but but I'll be visiting someone so I could if there's a problem. Okay, well, we need four for a quorum. Um, without you and Fred, we will still have a quorum, but we need everybody else to basically be here. Okay, so why don't you let me know if there's a problem and- How late do you want me to let you know? Um, I guess, if, you know, as soon as, as, as soon as you know, as soon as you could find out. Okay. So let's, I'm going to give a time here. No later than uh, noon on Tuesday, the second. Okay. Does that work? That, so if anyone can't make it on Tuesday, let me know, let us all know by noon. But don't our normal rules say at least 24 hours? I don't know what the rules are. Oh. I'm looking at two, but <laughs> hmm. things that maybe we should decide upon. <laughs> um, all right. And as a reminder, because I think I said this the last time, I'm not available on the 16th um, in the okay. event that we have a meeting then. 16th of November? Correct. Yeah. It looks like I'm, a, I'm around if, if necessary on the 16th. Yep. Good to know. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, Sue, what else do you have for us? Yeah. So I just want I just want to make a report that um, we have a we are planning a charrette next week. Um, the charrette deals with the it's in the South Hill area around Danby Road and um, King Roads. And um, how do I explain this? So the new neighborhood code that you all saw and recommended to the town board. So after its passage earlier this year, we had some developers come to the town and propose to use that new neighborhood code for um, some of their properties on South Hill. And so in the meantime, the, you know, those two properties didn't make up a complete neighborhood. So the town of Ithaca has hired some um, consultants and so, our consultants will work with the developers' consultants to um, undertake this uh, this charrette. So there are two public uh, presentations that are going to occur, and I'm going to send you all the flyer tomorrow, um, and uh, I'll show you a map of the area that's being impacted um, or being impacted, being planned for a new neighborhood. But the um, but there is so there's a public presentation. It's by YouTube on the town's YouTube uh, site. And so at, uh, at seven o'clock on Monday, this coming Monday, there'll be an introduction as to what the project's about. And then on Wednesday, after the design um, team uh, listens to some of the stakeholders, listens to um, you know just some of the concerns and uh, desires of some of the landowners, um, there will they'll put together a design, an idea for a master plan for that area and a regulating plan and present it to the public. It, it'll, it'll need fine tuning after that. And it'll certainly before it, you know, it will need an environmental review and there'll be public hearings, but it is, uh, it's, it's pretty exciting for us to see uh, perhaps the new neighborhood code being used in a 
traditional neighborhood development occurring at that intersection area of Danby Road and uh, King Road. What's a char charrette? A charrette is, it's often, it's often a planning charrette. It's often when you get a bunch of people together and you do an intensive, um, I don't know, a, 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 an intensive uh, designing and figuring out what kind of plan you want for an area. Yeah. So it's, it's like a workshop. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a group of people coming together, voicing their opinions around a table with whiteboards and drawings and How is this ideas spelled? and diagrams. And it's about just like throwing everything on the table and generating ideas. It's C-H-A-R-R-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. Yes. Yeah. Sort of like and charcuterie, the, but not quite as pretty. <laughs> yeah, the only problem is in the, you know, the era of COVID, we've had to modify. So there's a, there's yeah. masking up and there's a lot of zooming. <laughs> so, so unfortunately, yeah, it's not, it's, it's not when, we, when we started thinking about this, you know, back in May, um, you know, it took a while for us to get these plans together, but when we were thinking about it in May, things looked pretty hopeful, but uh, then unfortunately uh, less, less people actually sitting around a table, more zooming. Well, it sounds exciting. Yes. So, can I just ask, did the, have the developers, are they trying to buy the property to develop it or are they developing it in conjunction yeah. with owners? It's, it's the property owners that are initiating this. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's exciting. Yeah, it is very exciting. Yeah. Can, can, can you one, share- One large property, property owner in particular? Oh, oh sorry. we got two people, I didn't hear that. Let's see, Cindy was first, Fred. <laughs> I'm just curious. Can can you share who the property owners are, or is that... yeah yeah it's uh it's the Monkmeyer family owns owns a large parcel owns several large parcels in that area, and then uh, David Abel owns property on the other side of the he he owns some property right next to the hotel that's on the other mm -hmm. side of 96 B, and then he owns some vacant parcels behind the Holly Creek townhomes. But the, but the greater area is going to include, um, you know, everything from like Italian carryout, the uh, Dulce Delight, the gas station, the Montessori school. So there's other parcels to make this a whole uh, cohesive neighborhood. Um, so it's not just those two parcels. And that's where the town decided to come in and, um, you know, work together with the, with the consultants for the developer or for the landowners. So anyway, I'll send those flyers out and, you know, please, if you're interested and you have time on Monday and Wednesday, you know, tune in um, and, uh, you know, I think it'll be a bit of a process. So you, this wasn't the first time you're going to hear about this, but this is the initiation of the of the project. So it's pretty exciting. Yay, that is exciting. Yeah. A long time in the making. Yes, absolutely. From comprehensive plan in 2014 to finally. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so that's it. Liba, thank you. Exciting news. Anything else? It's Fred's birthday today. Oh, yeah, right. Birthday. <laughs> 67. Happy yeah, birthday. yeah. A nice prime number. <laughs> Happy birthday, Fred. Happy birthday. Thank you very much. And many more. Yeah. I, just came, I just came back from stat straddling the equator in Ecuador. Which was kind of cool. Wow. That was last Tuesday. And where are you going, November second? I'm um, October this weekend. I'm off to Uzbekistan. <laughs> wow! <Girl. laughs> I'm going to Uzbekistan for essentially two weeks. Wow! wow. Yep. yep. It's, time, it's time to go international again. It's not easy. <laughs> you got to test on the way out. You got to test on the way back. But it's the way it is. You also got to make sure everything's open. Yep. Yep. So, what does one do in Uzbekistan? <laughs> um, there are there are some striking uh, remnants of uh, of the Soviet Union's control when they were behind the Iron Curtain. Um, um, there's also uh, a lot of artwork. There's a the Silk Road used to travel through there. Mm -hmm. The old the old tra mm -hmm. the old trade uh, path into China and Tibet. Um, there's quite a bit to see, and there's also um, the unknown. I mean, it's, it, there's a lot I don't know about the area, so I'm looking forward to it. Hmm. Awesome. Hi. Yeah, wishing you safe travels. Yeah.
Okay. Yeah, but as long as I stay COVID free, I'm good. Nice. We're, we're still um, on YouTube Live and recording. Just wanted to remind you all of that. All right. And um, I wanted to uh, put a punch in for, um, we are still looking for planning board and zoning board uh, member applicants. If you know of anybody, we're getting down to crunch time. Should we mention harassment? Should we mention harassment training, which kind of popped up this afternoon? <laughs> Looks like we all have to take the um, harassment training course. Oh yes. Yeah, Judy's sending that out. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I saw something this afternoon. Oh. Yep. Mm -hmm. I put it in my spam folder. <laughs> uh, NeoGov, that's the worst site mm -hmm. name. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It looks spammy, doesn't it? It did. Look like yeah, a phishing did. email. I can thank <laughs> Judy that that we got the we got the email from the site before we got any word from the town that we were being signed up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah. Oh. I complained. Um. Don't forget to vote, everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, early voting is here at Town Hall, too, starting Saturday morning. Yeah. 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 The news, it's all going to be in the newsletter tomorrow. That's good. As well as the charrette. Oh, yeah. Double Great. R, double T. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I got to go. Bye, everybody. Right. Bye. Bye.